Welcome back. It's Friday. That means the doctors in live with TOA is back online. Um, forgive us ahead of time if we have some technological challenges. As you can see, we are now upscale in Studio 1A with actually seeing electronic things rather than a little paper poster. Man, we're awesome. Anyway, I'm Gray Stallman. I'm your host, and uh, thanks for being back. Um, Again, uh, as always, I hope that you all find that these uh, episodes are helpful, interesting, uh, thought-provoking. Um, my job, the way I look at it is, is I want to bring information to you that we talk about every day, we see every day, but if it's not happening to you, you wouldn't necessarily think about it. Um, TOA is the largest orthopedic practice in the state of Tennessee now. We have nearly 100 physicians, and we're all over the state from Knoxville to Columbia. Pretty amazing. We see patients from northern Alabama, southern Kentucky, um, and beyond. So um, you're in good company. Thanks for being here. Um, as always, um, while I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I'm fellowship trained. I'm not your orthopedic surgeon, except you, Carlos. And um, so please consider this information uh, just that information and education it's not maybe even a little entertainment it's not medical advice so if you have a musculoskeletal problem bones joints knees hips hands spine whatever um, go to toa.com uh, we can help you understand what's going on with you we can help you figure out who to see where to go what we can do to help you but go see an expert um, uh, let's just have a good time today and leave it at that. Anyway, so um, without further ado, uh, I'm, I'm by myself today, so sorry. But um, uh, I think what I wanted to do was kind of carry on from how we started this program with the spine world. And what I thought we'd do, rather than talking about specific diseases of the spine or problems of the spine, I'd step back and do what we call basic science, which basically I want to tell, talk to you about what spine surgery is trying to do. Um, not about a specific problem, because we've talked about a lot of different topics, but really the various parts of what spine surgery is doing. So you can kind of understand um, what I'm trying to accomplish to try to help you. Um, these are common things that we talk about in the office um, when I'm talking to somebody about surgery. And I figured I'd sit, give you guys this information uh, uh, for a little thought. Anyway, so we're going to call this series, and it's going to be kind of an open-ended series. It's called Spine Surgery 101. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about various aspects of spine surgery throughout the year. Um, they're in no particular order. Um, but uh, I think the first topic I wanted to talk about was spine fusion because that's kind of the one of the biggest things we do and it, it's kind of mysterious about what exactly is spine fusion why do we do spine fusion what is spine fusion and what what can we do to help things help people with this so um, a little bit of background fusion just means in spine terms, making something solid, basically welding two parts of your body together. Okay, um, and we'll get we'll touch on why we would do that in a second. But the basic science of that is a little bit of magic trick. When somebody breaks their leg and their bone snaps in two inside their leg. What happens is that bone, which is living tissue, it's not just a solid um, object of calcium. It actually has a blood supply to it. It changes and grows. What happens is that bone breaks. It bleeds. There are a bunch of cells that are kind of contained around that area where the break is. And it stimulates your body to grow bone. Uh, there are only two tissues in the body that reproduce themselves, that grow back with their own cells. And that's the liver 
and bone. Every other tissue, if it's traumatized or damaged, say you cut your skin or you get a knife uh, in the schoolyard in your gut and, and cut your intestines, what happens is those tissues heal with scar tissue. That's normal tissue, but it's not what the tissue was. So when you cut your skin, you get scarring, and that tissue is not skin tissue, but it's scar tissue. The liver can heal on its own. So when a liver gets cut or damaged or removed, it can heal back with liver tissue that's functional liver tissue. The bone is the same way. Bones grow with bone tissue. It's not scar tissue typically. And we use that to our advantage. So going back to that broken leg, you've got this encapsulated blood and cells and little bone fragments and stuff like that inside the body. And that mass of stuff has um, proteins in it, has um, certain types of cells that cause bone to grow. And so eventually put somebody in a cast with their broken leg and their leg heals and bone grows and becomes solid again. Well, spine fusion is taking advantage of that property. So in simple terms, spine fusion is trying to make the spine more rigid, more stable, or replace something that we've had to remove for, with another part of surgery. So we are using that trick, uh, that, that bony um, uh, process, we're tricking the body into thinking it's got a broken bone and basically creating an environment where the body says, ooh, it looks like I've got a broken bone. Don't know where it is, but it looks like it's right there, so let me grow bone. And so in, what we do is essentially create that traumatized, bloody area with the little bone fragments in it and the cells and the proteins and rely on your body to grow bone kind of where we're telling it to grow. So um, the reason why we would do a fusion is kind of comes down to several things. One, your spine has a problem that is an instability where things are moving like they shouldn't. Or um, we have to remove some of the bone either because it's broken or there's tumor in it or something like that. And we have to replace that removed segment with something to create or restore the stability of the spine. Those are the two main reasons why we do a fusion. Now there's a third one. Remember way back early, uh, Ryan Snowden talked about scoliosis. And scoliosis is a side-to-side -side curvature of the spine and what we're doing with treating scoliosis with surgery is to straighten up the spine and then what what we want is the spine to fuse together to become solid so it stays straight so that's a deformity correction problem so you have uh, something that i've had to remove like a broken bone or a tumor and restore stability something that's already moving more than it's supposed to an instability usually caused by degeneration and arthritis, or something that we're trying to create a new spine to take care of a problem that's a different spine. So the curvature we make straight, we hold it together with um, fusion. Now, a lot of people, when we do fusion, almost always these days, um, we add hardware or instrumentation. So in this model, that would be these guys here. These are screws and rods in between the bones. The screws are basically just anchors, okay? Something to hold on to the bone. The rod locks the sides together so that it can't move. And then what we do is we create that environment where bone will grow in this area by uh, traumatizing the bone and making it bleed, packing in bone material to uh, basically tell the, or think fake the body out if you will to think that it has a broken bone and we want it to grow bone where we put the bone and so ultimately while the hardware is in there to hold things still and i'll tell you why in a second the fusion is not the hardware the fusion is actually the bone growing okay the hardware is there to hold things still and the reason why we want to hold things still is because movement 
around where there is a bone that we want to try to grow together can break up the little cells that are trying to cross over, okay? So you've got, microscopically, you've got little gaps. The bone cells that your body produces is tr are trying to fill those gaps. But if those gaps keep opening and closing, those little cells can't jump across that very well, and sometimes it won't grow or fuse together. And so the hardware makes it more rigid. It's almost like a splint or a cast internally um, to hold things still enough so that then the bone can grow and become bridging across that area. Now the hardware in some, somebody, for example, who's having a scoliosis fusion for a, uh, a curvature, the hardware holds the spine in the position we want it in while the bone grows together. So eventually, if everything works out, the, bone is, the spine is now solid. Theoretically, we could remove the hardware. It's not doing anything once it's all fused. We typically don't remove the hardware unless we're just forced to because there's really no reason to remove it. It's designed to stay in there. But in simple terms, fusion is making things more rigid in your spine or stopping motion in your spine. And that's really the bone growing together and becoming solid. So you have these moving parts that are you know, separated. They become solid together. The hardware is not the fusion, but it's a splint inside to try to help that fusion to become strong. And again, we, never, we typically don't have to remove the hardware unless there's some sort of problem or some reason to. Um, the challenge with fusion is, again, we're kind of playing a little game with the body. Uh, bones don't always heal. Fusions don't always become solid. There's a lot of reasons why. Some of them are health reasons, like people who have poor healing, such as diabetics, such as people who have a lot of diseases, such as people who are on lots of medications that can create healing problems like the, what my brother-in-law would call the ibs and abs, these, these new biologic medications for things like rheumatoid arthritis and, and psoriatic arthritis can cause healing problems because they alter your, your immune system. But also, uh, cigarette smoking is a big one that can retard or stop bone cells from continuing to grow. In the, in the spine, because we're creating a, a situation that looks to the body like it's a broken bone, the more segments you try to fuse together, the less likely they're all going to fuse together because the body's working hard to try to you know, create this new bone and sometimes it just peters out. And so there are tricks or tools that we use to try to help maximize the chance that we're gonna get a fusion. And the reason why that's important is studies have certainly shown that if you attempt a fusion, you get a better outcome if the fusion becomes solid. You get less of a good outcome if the fusion doesn't become solid. It's what's called a non-union or pseudarthrosis. Those are the big words. But basically it just means that bone cells didn't grow all the way across and those bones aren't rigidly held together. And so people have not as good of an outcome if they don't get a solid fusion, if we're trying to create fusion. So there's some factors involved that can, can retard fusion and uh, um, disease processes, certain medications, cigarette smoking, lots of uh, levels that we're trying to fuse. But there are some tools that we have to try to increase the chance of fusion. Those include the hardware. The more rigid we can hold it, the better likelihood is that we can get a fusion. We use bone that typically comes from the patient. We also use bone that comes from a donor bank that's human bone that acts like a scaffolding for it to kind of direct our bodies to grow bone. But there are also some man-made materials, and we'll, we'll actually talk about these in a different episode because it's a pretty detailed explanation, but there are actually some man-made materials 
that try to help promote bone growth or bone fusion. And they kind of fall into a couple of categories. One are bone substitutes. Another are proteins that actually come from the human body that we know promote bone fusion that are man-made to try to increase the chance of fusion. Um, so we try everything we can to make sure that we get a solid fusion. Um, fusion takes a while. If you look at somebody who breaks their leg, you're typically in a cast for ballpark about three months to some degree. Why is that? Because it takes that long for the bone cells to grow together and become more rigid and stable. Bone fusion in the spine can actually take longer than that because we don't, again, we're not dealing with a broken bone, we're kind of dealing with a fake out. We're kind of fooling the body a little bit. And so bone fusion can take six months to a year to become solid. And so uh, there's a lot of times when, while, while the, the surgery's gone well and people's wound is healed, we're still waiting six months to a year for it to become as solid as it can be. The nice thing about a fusion is it's the, once it's solid, it's pretty darn durable. Nothing can really happen to that part of the spine. The unfortunate thing is fusion does have some consequences. Okay, and this is kind of the last thing we'll kind of talk about a little bit. Fusion doesn't give you a new spine. I can't, we don't have a spine replacement, so I can't take parts out and put new ones in and make it like the way you were born, like the way you were intended. Fusion is a compromise. It's a substitute to try to help manage the symptoms that you're dealing with from whatever problem you have, whether it's a tumor, a fracture, a degenerative instability, uh, a curvature, those types of things. So a fusion is not natural in that it's not something that your body was designed to have. It's a natural process, but it's a man-controlled process. So fusion doesn't give you a normal spine. What I tell people is fusion gives you a different spine than what you started with. The hope of the fusion is to make it so that you feel better. You have more stability, less pain, um, better alignment. But because we're taking part of the body, a very complicated structure that was designed and meant to move and make it solid in areas, you can pretty much guess there's some consequences to that. And the major consequence of having a fusion is the fact that we start, if this down here, so these screws are across this bone, this bone, and this bone, so this part of the spine is now solid. It was designed to move and it used to move, but now it doesn't. What happens here? What we start seeing is the next door neighbors, above or below, can start wearing out more rapidly than they would have if you had not had a fusion because they're bearing more of the load. These guys were meant to move. They're no longer moving. They're not sharing the movement or the load as the other ones are. So we can see more aggressive wearing out or degeneration of the next door neighbor levels. Unfortunately, that's a process and a consequence that we can't get away from. Again, fusion is designed to take care of what's going on now. We can't predict what's going to happen into the future. We do know that fusion can increase the chance of possibly wearing out the moving parts next door, but it's something we have to live with because what we're dealing with is what we've got now. Some people have a fusion and have no further problems. Some people have a fusion and have uh, problems down the road that require treatment. A few people have fusion and have problems down the road that are really quite quick, relatively soon after surgery, and need further treatment. The reason why that is, is because the body, and the spine in particular, is constantly changing. Remember when we started this talk, I told you about bone being living tissue. One of the magical qualities of bone 
is that it follows what's called Wolf's Law, which means it changes its biology and its three-dimensional uh, structure depending on the forces it sees. So bones under lots of force get stronger or thicker or change in shape in order to maximally resist those forces. Bone is living tissue. It changes. The trouble with the aging process is that degrades our bodies and our bodies change as well. So you can have a solid fusion now, but as the process of aging goes on, the other parts are still moving and they can wear out. And that's where you have that next door neighbor phenomenon. So we wish we had a, a magical cure of medicine or, a, or a, a something, implant of something. We wish we had a spine replacement, but we don't. So in order to help us help people with their problems, um, fusion is one option. Now fusion isn't for everybody. It's not for every problem. Um, as you can imagine, I've talked mostly about instability. I've talked about loss of integrity of the spine with either a fracture or a tumor or something like that. And I've talked about deformity, curvature. What I've not talked about is some other things like ruptured discs or spinal stenosis, which go back to one of our previous lectures is narrowing in the spine that are not a, uh, a process where the spine is needs to be restricted in its mobility. Those don't need fusion most of the time. But when fusion is required, um, uh, we use every tool we can to make sure we can get a fusion. Again, tricking the body into thinking it's got a broken bone. And try to minimize the chance that we're going to have problems down the road. We can't make that chance zero, but we try to minimize it. So this is an ongoing, never-ending technology showdown. Um, there is no right answer at this point. I don't think we'll ever find the solution to somebody's problem that's a single solution. I think every surgical treatment we have for a patient's spine problem is going to be individualized to that person. We're going to find things that work better than others. We're going to find some technologies or hardwares or implants or man-made systems that work better than others. But we're ne unfortunately never going to be able to make it normal because let's face reality, surgery on the, on the body is not something that your body was designed to do. It's man, physicians, modern healthcare, doing things to your body to try to help. But that's not natural. It's not natural to have surgery on your spine. It doesn't mean it can't be effective. It's just not something that Mother Nature designed us to do. So um, uh, I think that's the thing about fusion. Okay, so again, a little bit of uh, recap. Fusion is actually the bone growing together. It's not the hardware. The hardware is really a splint inside the body to hold things more rigidly. Fusion is used for places where we want to stop motion. We want to improve stability. We want to restore integrity of the spine so it's connected together like it's supposed to. We want to change the position of the spine. That's why we do fusion. Fusion is a biological process of bone where we're essentially trying to trick the body into thinking you have a broken bone and your body knows when I have a broken bone I put more bone tissue there and we're basically telling the body put bone here. So that's the, that's the biology of fusion. There are things that can affect how well fusion occurs. Those include diseases, diabetes, immune problems, it can be medications, particularly those medicines that affect our immune system or our healing system, steroids, for example. Cigarette smoking, big operations have a higher chance of not fusing. But we have some other technologies that we can use to try to minimize 
that problem, those problems of non-fusion, such as bone graft, bone material, man-made bone substitutes, proteins that are uh, help produce bone growth. The last thing I forgot to mention is there are both internal and external electronic devices that can help improve bone growth. They're actually devices that are stimulators to the body. The electrical signals, the frequency and, uh, uh, and whatnot of the electrical signals actually stimulates those little bone cells to grow. And sometimes we use those to try to augment or to achieve a solid fusion. So I hope that's helpful. Again, I didn't want to talk about specific disorders um, that we would use fusion in. Um, it's really more about what I'm trying to accomplish, what I'm trying to do with the human body to achieve the ultimate goal, which is better function, better support, better stability, or better uh, alignment of the spine. And fusion is a major component of what I have to offer people in those circumstances. Not everybody's a candidate for fusion. Uh, fusion can be done uh, throughout the spine, uh, and there are a variety of ways of achieving fusion. And we can talk about one of the, those in a later time, kind of approaches to how you get to it. This model is uh, a fusion that has been done from behind. You can actually uh, uh, attack the spine from the front, from behind, from the side. Those are more implant or technology-based um, decisions that surgeons make. So anyway, I hope that's somewhat helpful. Um, for those of you who've undergone fusion and your doctor never told you about this kind of stuff, it's probably pretty interesting to you. For those folks who've had a fusion attempt that didn't go well because it didn't fuse, maybe it helps to understand why that's a problem. Um, anyway, so sometime down the road, we'll talk about other topics such as decompression, which is removal of pressure on the nerves. We can talk about various implants, whether that's screws or cages or spacers or even uh, disc replacements um, and other, other forms of, of spine surgical kind of science stuff. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. Um, next week, we have a guest coming back, Dr. Bartley McGeehy. He's a sports medicine trained doc in our Franklin office primarily, although he also practices at St. Thomas West office. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about one of the things that in the Franklin office we actually have the ability to offer, which is kind of the continuity of care from, from beginning to end. So coming in the door, seeing the doctor, getting your pictures, potentially having your surgery, recovering from surgery, rehab, and then return to your activities. So it's going to be kind of an interesting perspective. It affects all of us in musculoskeletal care. It's particularly um, pertinent to the sports medicine, the shoulders, knees, hips guys, uh, trying to restore function from a part of the body that has failed. Um, so I think it'll be an interesting conversation. Um, he's a local boy and I, he's been around a long time and he's a good guy. So anyway, so until next time, um, think about, consider, strongly getting a vaccination. I think it's all of our responsibility to take care of everybody else. Um, it's my opinion, but I think that the vaccinations are safe and effective and important. Um, go to toa.com. We can tell you about Tennessee Orthopedic Alliance, our physicians, our services. You can go to the media center. We have a whole catalog of informational videos. Uh, from a variety of practitioners. You can even go back and see my ugly mug on old uh, videos if you want to. Um, and then, you know, if you need an appointment, if you have a problem, don't just sit on it. We can help you restore your lifestyle and function uh, with the latest sensible technologies out there, okay? So let us help you. Don't just suffer um, and... Uh, and, and escape from the world. Let us get you back in the game, okay? Anyway, go out there, have your best life. Um, have a great weekend. Uh, we'll see you next Friday at noon with Dr. McGee. Take care.